Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and welcome to The Martini, Candid Conversations with a Twist. My name is Gus. I'm Ari Rentals Director of Business Development for North America, and I've been with the Ari family now for over 17 years, and honored to be your host today. At Ari Rental, our goal is to equip you, the filmmakers, with the most inspiring image technology in the world. Our services cross borders and continents with a network of facilities in North America, Europe, and the UK bringing you first-class camera, lighting, and grip equipment, wherever you may be. Our team is there to welcome you with friendly expertise, personalized solutions, and a relationship built on trust. As a friendly reminder, please send us your questions via the Q&A tab on Zoom, and we'll get to as many of them as possible during the course of the show today. Okay, with us today, we have the hardest working producer in the state of Rhode Island, Erica Hampson. Erica began her career in 2005, producing short films such as Five Minutes, Mr. Wells, and the Academy Award winning The New Tenants. Erica's other projects include the features Robot and Frank, Meadowland, The Discovery, Where is Kira, Life Itself, Late Night, The Photograph, and the upcoming features Ava and The Good House. Welcome, Erica. So glad you could join us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> um, so I always like to start our conversations with a few kind of uh, silly icebreaker questions. I hope you're okay with that. Sure. <laughs> and I change it up every week just to keep everybody on their toes, including my colleagues that are online with us so they never know what to expect. So, <laughs> so for today, I figured I would pull a couple of fun movie quotes and see if you can uh, oh, tell us what movies they're from. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's not too bad. It's just Get ready to, to watch me fail. <laughs> oh, I, I have faith in you. I do. Okay. All right. So the first one, and I'm not going to attempt to do any accents or you know vocal impressions whatsoever because that would just be terrible. Um, but here we go. You don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I have no idea. I'm going to oh. be terrible at the game. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that was uh, On the Waterfront with Marlon Brando. Okay. <laughs> now this one, one of my personal favorites. What we have here is a failure to communicate. Again, no idea. Is it bad if I can while we're on this? I can like quickly. <laughs> You're going to start Google. <laughs> Google. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that was Cool Hand Luke with Paul Newman. And, uh, oh boy, here's another one completely off of in left field. <laughs> Wait, where are you going? I was going to make espresso. Yeah, nope. <laughs> Line producer, don't know. <laughs> uh, I love it. All right. <laughs> so that was from Young Frankenstein. Excellent. Okay, last one. We, I'm not going to beat you up anymore. We'll do the last one here. Okay. Well, that's how it crumbles, you know, cookie-wise. Uh, Cookie Monster Sesame Street episode. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Win. <laughs> that was from Billy Wilder's The Apartment, another one of my favorite films. Sorry. <laughs> I'm brutal. I'm brutal. <laughs> okay. Well, that was fun. Um, thank you for <laughs> indulging me. <laughs> so, um, can you, uh, kind of give us a little bit of your background and how you got started in this industry? Yeah, sure. Um, I moved to New York right after college and uh, got my first job in the industry was on the TV series, Law and Order, Criminal Intent. Uh, I was a production assistant there and, you know, did that for a couple of years and eventually ended up being the personal assistant to the lead actor, Vincent D'Onofrio. And along the way, he decided to write and direct a movie that he was going to sell finance and I think because we had a shorthand and trusted one another he asked me to produce it it was super low budget um and I said yes I mean I had no idea what I was doing but thought it sounded like a good opportunity and so that was my first shot at you know what I do now we went upstate and shot a movie in 12 days on his property in upstate New York um in between seasons of criminal intent and the crew came up and helped us make the movie. So I cut my teeth on that. And it was on that set that I met um, this guy, Sam Bisbee, whose wife 
Jackie, along with the DP Lance Accord, uh, owns a, a commercial company called Park Pictures, and they were about to open a feature division. So, you know, when we wrapped that movie, he asked if I wanted to help make their first attempt at a movie, which was the short film, The New Tenants, that you mentioned earlier. So, you know, I said yes to that. And then on that movie, I met someone else who had, you know, so suddenly it was like I, I was no longer a personal assistant. I just sort of fell into uh, producing and made uh -huh. a career of it. <laughs> it's amazing. I think it's, uh, you know, some people are always asking, you know, how do you get into this industry and how do you get started? And, you know, just as you spoke of, you know, it's all about who you meet and the connections you make and how powerful that can be. And, yeah, and, and making know. the most of the opportunities, I think, that are handed to you, you know, along the way. So. Yeah. So do you ever say no? <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> Just anything that anyone, you know, dropped into my lap. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, now, now I uh, am lucky enough that I get to say no. Yeah. So how, I mean, that's, that's an interesting transition from, you know, working directly with somebody like that to then taking on, you know, a, a kind of a producer type role mm -hmm. in that way. I mean, I'm, I'm just curious to hear more about, you know, how that transition went, you know, and what, what you, you know, I'd love to hear about the, the mistakes you possibly had made and learned from and what you found, you know, most challenging about jumping into that. Yeah, I mean, I made, I think I made a lot of mistakes. You know, it's, it was, I, I mean, I went from truly being someone who like got his coffee and, you know, updated his scripts to someone who was mm. in charge of $100,000 of his money. And like, I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. I, you know, I, I kept track of the budget on sticky post-it notes that I would hang up in the wall of the hotel room. Like, I didn't know that there was budgeting software. I didn't know anything. So I got thrown into the deep end. Um, and, you know, with every movie, I would take baby steps towards something new and bigger. Like, you know, my next movie was um, Union, which was something that blew my mind. You know, the idea of paying mm. health benefits and, you know, fringes and payroll companies. And um, so I don't know. I mean... <laughs> I don't know the specific mistakes I, I made along the way. I had really great people around me, like the folks at Criminal Intent, the producers there were really rooting for me. So like on Vincent's movie, I could call them, you know, during their summer break and like I could just walk away from the crew and whisper my question to them and they would sort of feed me the answer of what they would do if they were in my shoes. And, you know, so I, I learned from, from great folks and with every movie I tried to take on, you know, a more challenging uh, film with a bigger budget uh, so that I could, learn something new. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Cause it's always, I've tried to understand exactly how you would get into a role like that. You know, it's like, cause I don't think it's something you necessarily could teach. You know, I think it's probably more about the experience and, and people sharing with you, you know, the best practices, best processes. And yeah, I think you learn along the way. And I mean, when I went to college, like I didn't, I didn't know what a line producer was. I didn't know that that was like they didn't teach it. I think they actually do teach that now. And, and people are aware of the fact that it's something that they can do with their lives. But yeah. I mean, I hated math growing up. So it's like, it's just funny to me that now it's, you know, this is what I do. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but it is, it's a lot of learning on the job, I think more than. To, yeah. <laughs> more than a lot of time. <laughs> Note to self. So the next time my son comes in and says, why do I have to do this math project? You know, and I'll say, because someday you're going to be a line producer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and <laughs> and you're gonna be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's actually an interesting question kind of attached to that that came in from one of our uh, audiences and you know um, who would you consider to be a mentor along that way um, I think you know there's an accountant whose name is Robin Reitman and she was on that like the first job that I did after Vincent's that was mm -hmm. union and I mean, she's the one who sort of told me that there was a budgeting program and sat me down and taught me um, about the different contracts and where I could find the rates. And, and I think, you know, without her, it would have taken a lot longer. Like she really took me under her wing. And then, um, you know, again, the producers from Criminal Intent, I mean, Mary Ray Thulis and John Roman and um, Mike Smith, who's now a director, like those guys all um, have been doing it for such a long time that, you know, they really imparted a lot of, a lot of wisdom. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. I, I, that's one of the things that I personally love about the industry is that even though there can be so much, you know, so much negative sometimes talked about it and the things that we deal with at the same time, the people we work with are so sharing and so giving. 
and that's what makes it successful. And I think that's what makes it also addictive in a way that yeah. like you can't, once it's in your blood, you can't leave it. Um, it becomes part of your family. So, <laughs> um, so let's, let's discuss, uh, one of the features, um, that you did called the discovery. Um, and I'm curious what drew you to that project and, uh, tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah. I mean, that was a movie where every aspect of it was appealing to me. I'm from the start, uh, a producer named Alex Rolofsky sent me the script and he was someone, I mean, I had been following his work for a while. He produced Half Nelson and Place Beyond the Pines and Blue Valentine. So I was a huge fan of his. And then the fact that he reached out to ask if I wanted to be a part of his next project just was a huge honor. Um, and then the director, Charlie McDowell and his writing partner, Justin Later, they had made a movie called The One I Love. So you know, just going into it, I was already a fan of the people involved. Uh, Rudy Mara was already attached. Jason Siegel was already attached. They were telling me that Robert Redford was probably going to sign on. They were saying he was going to shoot in New England, which is where I grew up. Um, so like before I'd even read the script, I was in. And then, you know, I read the script and, and just fell in love. So that was just sort of one of those magical movies where from start to finish, you know, the crew was great. Um, we had just shot in Newport, Rhode Island. It was a great experience. And then the movie ended up premiering at Redford's um, festival, Sundance. So, and it was like a cool, Charlie and Justin write, they don't really, they're not formulaic, you know, like they come up with really original ideas. Their movies are very cool. And so I liked the fact that it was, it was different. Mm. And it was all completely location? Um, yeah, it was actually. Wow. We were all over the place. We shot the majority of it in Newport, Rhode Island. We shot pieces of it in Providence, but it was completely location. Yeah. And from, from my standpoint, I remember us working on that a bit. And um, I had ju just met Sterla at uh, the Camera Maj, uh Film Festival like a couple months prior. And then all of a sudden it was like, hey, Gus, I've got a project. And I was like, oh, this is great. And then all of a sudden I found out you were attached to it. And it was yeah. like, this is all right. This is a match made in heaven here. Um, and then you guys made the commitment to shoot film, which I mean, even what, what that film was six years ago or more. Yeah. I'm trying to think what was. yeah. I mean, that's, that's a challenge upon itself, even for an independent film uh, sometimes to, you know, find the ways to make that work um, to keep that medium alive. Yeah. It was great. I mean, Sterla's Sterla's awesome. He's, he was, yeah. A very cool DP to work with, really talented and super production friendly. So, yeah, yeah, that's very cool. <laughs> and then, um, then you went on to another project uh, that sounded like it was uh, logistically pretty challenging, um, called Like Father. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that movie it it's a movie that takes place on a cruise ship during hurricane season. And that's like not even the plot of the movie. That's just like the real life uh, reality of what we were up against. It was, um, you know, removing the hurricane season from the equation. It was, we shot for two weeks in New York. And then the idea was that we were gonna move to Florida, shoot two weeks there, hop on a cruise ship, shoot two weeks on Royal Caribbean, uh, get off the cruise ship, shoot in Jamaica, and then come home. So for me, it was a lot of like figuring out which crew we were going to take with us from New York to Florida, who the new folks in Florida were going to be that we picked up of the combined crews, who were we going to take into the Caribbean on the cruise ship, um, you know, getting the gear from place to place. And then on top of it, you know, we successfully shot the two weeks in New York, got down to Florida, got in one of our days there, and then Hurricane Irma um, hit and was coming straight for us in Fort Lauderdale. So we had to pile onto a bus and evacuate to Orlando, uh, where we rode out the, the hurricane in Disney. Um, and then ended up getting on the cruise ship a few days late because the ship couldn't get into the port. So, you know, because of that, we couldn't shoot all of the scenes that we were supposed to shoot on the ships. Then we had to come back to New York and build a set to match the ship. I mean, it was just like, you know, one of those movies where every day was, it felt like something was going, was going logistically wrong. Wow. <laughs> but it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes uh yeah mother nature has a tendency to throw things in, uh, <laughs> in a little bit of a spiral <laughs> it was um you know it was challenging i got to learn new things every day so i'm grateful mm. for that. but uh, yeah it was hard 
and an interesting cast. I would imagine. I mean, it, I can't remember what the budget was of that film. I remember us talking a little bit about it when it was popping up. Um, yeah. But yeah, you had small window to to work within too, right? Yeah, well, it was very, I think we could only shoot, like the cruise ship could only offer us a very specific two weeks. So we had to build our entire world um, around that. Uh, and yeah, the, it was Kelsey Grammer and Kristen Bell and Seth Rogen. We had, I mean, we had a great cast, you know, and it was, it was fun. It was just hard. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine because that's, that's almost like, you know, you're getting hit from multiple fronts on, on everything that you have to work out within that small time period. So, you know, to be impacted by <laughs> a yeah, hurricane I, on top of that. <laughs> like looking back, I know, it was funny because as the crew was starting to get hired, you know, they would come into the office and be like, you guys are like choosing to make a film on a cruise ship during hurricane season. I was like, yeah, I don't, you know, what could possibly go wrong? And then. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like, that sounds like a tagline on a movie poster. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> uh, and then, so, that was just kind of a snippet of what you had done in the independent film world. Um, and then you started moving up into uh, higher budget studio projects. And um, one of the ones you've, you've been talking to me about is uh, life itself. So I'm curious how you transitioned from going from independent to a uh, bigger budget studio. Yeah. I mean, I just, the transition was I just worked really hard to get the job. I mean, up until that point, I really was living in the independent world. You know, I, I was doing five to $10 million movies pretty consistently. And then uh, this script came along and I read it and thought it was just the best script I'd ever read. It was Dan Fogelman who um, created This Is Us on NBC. You know, he wrote that, he was gonna direct it. And um, I just fought really hard to, to get it. I did a bunch of interviews and it was, the budget was double anything I had done up until that point. So, I mean, the transition, I learned that even if you have more money, it's, it's basically the same. You just have, you know, like the day to day of what I have to do um, is more challenging, but the problems are, are pretty similar to what I encountered on an indie movie. But for me, it was just about working really hard. Like I saw it as um, an opportunity to move up. And I knew that if I did a, a good job on this, that I would hopefully have, other chances to work in the studio world, which is something I had been, you know, hoping to do for a long time and, and to get bigger budgets. So that really, like that movie pushed me out of my comfort zone and, um, you know, just made me want to work my butt off <laughs> to prove myself. Yeah. I, I remember coming and meeting you one day while you were on set and you were just, I mean, it was interesting because usually during production in your shooting on location in New York city, you know, most people I talk to are just ready to rip their hair out and they don't want to even, they don't even want to talk to you or text you during that. Right. So I, and you and I met up and you were just glowing and you were so happy and everything was great. And we sat down and we had dinner and I was like, wow, this is, I'm, she's in the middle of shooting. She's having a blast. This is awesome. So, yeah, we had that's awesome, a, I think, right. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's, uh, to me, that's, that's going to be like a long lasting impression for me because I was just, I was watching you really, you know, you were just in a, in a different state at that point. And I was like, Oh, this is so cool. You know, she's happy and she's doing something she really loves and she's made this jump and that's fantastic. So. Yeah, it was a blast. And I got to work with, you know, awesome producers. I mean, it was just, it was another sort of great experience from start to finish. Yeah. And then we got to go to Spain. We ended our, our movie in Spain shooting for two weeks there. So it was perfect. Interesting. So, you know, when you do a production like that, that has two very, very different locations mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious about, because I hear this from a lot of different productions, you know, working out the logistics of how are you going to take this and then move it over there? What are the, what are the absolute like basic necessities that you have to take with you? And then what, what do you identify as being able to deal with locally when you do a show like that? I mean, I think that's, that's probably determined, you know, it's different for every production. I mean, for us, we shot, we started in New York. And so we started to see how the team was coming together, you know, and it became very clear that the actors were really reliant on, you know, the hair and makeup people. So we were going to have to, because in Spain, we had the luxury of working with the production services company and they had an entire crew available to us if we wanted. Mm. So we could have brought no one over, but you know, it became clear that like the actors were going to want the hair and makeup folks and we needed our department heads and, you know, it just, so, I, but I've done, that's like one of several films now that I've started in New York and then we've moved to either, you know, 
like move to a different country. And I think it really just, it depends on, you know, whether the DP feels like he can do without his operators and take on someone new, you know, when you move to, to a different country or if that's going to disrupt the flow. And I think for the most part, you know, we took our department heads, hair and makeup, but otherwise we, we took our AD. Um, and then otherwise we just sort of picked up, you know, we had a week of prep where we could kind of get to know everybody over there and, and just jumped in. Wow. The new crew. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it's, it's, it never ceases to amaze me how much, you know, our industry is able to adapt like that so quickly. And we've just become almost like a nomad kind of community that is so used to being able to move around and, and figure out how to live and be able to work and do what you have to do. It's, it's logistically amazing to me. Yeah, it's true. And I think it's, it speaks to the fact that there's a lot of really talented crew members um, throughout, you know, the entire world. I mean, we were in a super tiny town uh, in Spain and they had a fantastic crew. So, you know, no matter where you can go, it, it seems like, or no matter where you go, it seems like you can sort of tap into the film community there. Right. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> And um, so you just wrapped a project for Amblin called The Good House. I actually know nothing about this, so I'm, I'm really anxious to hear about the project and hear about the experience and, uh, and what your take was on it. Yeah, it was a great experience. It was my first time working with Amblin, uh, and I had a blast. I think they're a great uh, company. They were super supportive. And it was fun for me because the directors, uh, Maya Forbes and Wally Wallardowski, are people that I've made. This was our third movie together. Um, so it was really fun. They brought me back. They brought back uh, the DP, Andre Bowden-Schwartz. They brought back uh, the production designer that, you know, we had all worked together. So it was like a fun little reunion, except in Canada this time. We, we shot the movie in a small town called Chester in Nova Scotia. Um, which was great. We shot it in the fall. So, you know, with the summer season ending, uh, it was almost like a back lot. We just had the run of the entire town. Um, the locals were super happy to have us. And it's a, it's a really cool movie. Sigourney Weaver is the lead. So it was a dream to, to make a movie with her. Um, and it's a, it's a movie about, she plays like just sort of a woman who, you know, used to be top dog in what she does for a living. Uh, but over the years has uh, become an alcoholic and um, her protege is starting to take over her business and take away her clients. And it's sort of a story of whether she's going to choose to redeem herself and, and pick up the pieces of her life or not. Mm. It's, I'm anxious to see Sigourney Weaver in action because she's just iconic, you know, I think for our generation, especially, right? <laughs> yeah, it was really, it was really an honor to work with her. But like the thing that I liked watching was that the entire cast who a lot of them are established and name actors themselves were just in awe of the fact that they were getting to work with her. So I think all of us were starstruck. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, when do we get to see this? I mean, have you heard, heard any word? On... Well, it was supposed to come out, I think in November. Um, but I mean, that was pre pandemic. Mm. stuff. I have no idea if that's going to change <laughs> or not, but I think universal was going to release it uh, in November. Mm. So I, that kind of leads me to a question I had that actually, I, you know, we didn't talk about earlier, but I, I, I like to hear everybody's impression of what the current situation is and what you're hearing and what do you think is going to change, you know, especially for you uh, going forward. I mean, what do you see the change being in your role and how you approach a film now? I mean, I think for me, it's just going to a lot of making sure that the, the crew and the cast feel safe and taken care of and, um, you know, a lot of that is going to be up to the unions and, and the studios trying to figure out the new protocols and safety precautions. And then it's my job to make sure uh, that the production I'm on, you know, adheres to it. But I mean, I think a lot has to change um, just, you know, by nature. There's mm. hundreds of us sort of around each other all the time. And, you know, the way that we cater, the way that we clean the sets, the way, you know, touching the gear. I mean, it just, it's going to be a big overhaul, I think. Do you think, so have you had to, um, have you had to budget for a film yet post COVID? No, I mean, I was on a movie that we're on hiatus right now. We were halfway through our prep. Um, so, you know, the idea being that we'll pick back up, uh, hopefully in late summer or fall, but I, I don't think anybody really knows. Like we are starting to have those conversations now. Um, but I, you know, I think everybody is still trying to figure out sort of what the, 
what the exact protocols are going to be. So t- until that happens, I just, I mean, I can, it's going to cost, you know, a lot of money. So if there's just a line in a budget where you can put like a lot of money, <laughs> a lot of uh, pandemic money. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what the insurance requirements are going to be yeah. for the, the industry going forward. Um, it's yeah. A lot of questions right now. It's um, pretty interesting. Yeah. You have, uh, you know, there's plenty of shows out there just sitting in the wings, ready to go that were kind of in a situation similar to what you were, where they were in prep and they were very, very close to starting principal and then they had to shut down. Um, but you know, the studios or the networks or the streaming services have told them, listen, basically, and I, I don't know the exact verbiage of this, but we want you to do kind of a, um, uh, you, I'm sorry, you may have a better word for it, but basically prep this. So it's ready to go. Mm-hmm. like that at the snap of a finger. Um, and I think there sounds like there's a lot of productions that are in that situation. right? Yeah, now. It's almost like a virtual prep from home type of thing. Mm-hmm. Where people are trying to do that so that everything's ready to go. But I mean, again, I don't think any of us are going to want to go back to work until we know that it's safe, you know? So I, I feel like a lot has to be sorted out between now and then. Mm. Could you see, um, could you see location photography location based productions actually rethink and look at doing things more local or stage at this point? I mean, maybe it's such a hard thing to think. I mean, the majority of the movies that I'm involved in, it's mostly practical locations, you know, not stage work. So it would involve sort of a, I think they have to be almost written for that. You know, people would have to decide that they don't feel safe shooting in practical locations and then writers will have to create content where that's not a thing that we have to do. But like, I, I don't know. It's such a hard thing for me to wrap my brain around because I don't know how realistic it is to think that like everything can be shot in stage um, in the film world at least, but I'm yeah. leaving that to the people above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. There's people above you. Yeah, Hold on a second. So many. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've gotten some really good questions that have come in from the audience. So I'd like us to kind of take some of those and, uh, and run with them and see what, uh, see what we had here. So, um, so let me see what we have. Um, as long as no questions involve quotes for movies. Hey, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any of those yet, but, uh, I'll make sure to uh, highlight those when they do come up. <laughs> um, so here's an interesting one. What is your favorite part about producing you know what is it that you enjoy the most in the process i like the prep period the most um i mean the most fun is when the movie's done and you go to the premiere you know and you get celebrated all but like outside of that it's there's something very satisfying about um prepping a film because you know it's always like the the script always needs to sort of be backed into the budget and i like that process of working with the department heads and the director and the producers to figure out creative ways to still make a great film, but to do it, you know, within the money that we've been given. Um, So that's, that's just a lot of, a lot of fun for me. And I take the prep pretty seriously. So um, that by the time we're shooting, it's hopefully a well-oiled machine. Mm. It's uh, I, I hear a lot of, I've got friends um, in the production world and they spend the majority of their time doing budgets for other films, they're not necessarily involved um, in the making of those films, but they just sit there and they do budgets for that. And I'm, I'm, I've always been curious as to how do you do that? I mean, if somebody, basically somebody's handing you a script and saying, make a budget for this. I'm just curious what, you know, what are the key steps that you have to do when, when that's uh, handed to you? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times, I, the first question I always ask is how much are you ultimately hoping to make it for so that I can read it with that number in mind. <clears throat> um, And then, you know, it's just a lot of communicating. Like I'll talk to the, if there's already a director and a DP on board, you know, I'll want to know about their process and if they like to shoot with a lot of toys and cranes and cameras or if they keep things simple, um, you know, and just in general sort of how they feel about small crew versus big crew. And, you know, it's just, it's a lot of just talking to everybody and and figuring out what they think they're going to need to make the best film. And then I budget accordingly. And, you know, and a lot of it is just experience. Like I can, you know, read something and just, sort of know how much you know that certain special effect is going to cost and so that's it really is just a lot of um once you've been doing it long enough you know you just 
No. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's interesting. I've heard from never, a number of people that, you know, the camera line specifically can be one of the highest. Um, is that true or is that, is that just kind of a... <laughs> I mean, I think it just, it just depends. But I mean, traditionally, it's, it's usually like the, depending on where you're shooting, it's usually the transportation and location lines that tend to be really expensive. I mean, you know, I think if you're working with a really big name or a DP who likes to shoot, you know, multiple cameras every day at once, then sure, it can be expensive. But like, I don't find it to be uh, one of the more expensive lines. Mm, okay. <laughs> yeah. Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> well, we at Rental, we'll see what we can do about that. You've <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> been giving me fantastic note, deals all these years. No, yeah, note to self, raise prices. <laughs> yeah. Okay, very good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's I mean, it certainly, it is an expensive line, but like, I don't look at it and think like, you know, that it's out of proportion with the rest of the budget or more than it should be. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that helps me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's an interesting question. While you were shooting on the cruise ship, um, were there passengers aboard during production? Yeah, it was, um, I think at the time it was the biggest cruise ship uh, on the sea. And so there were 8,000 people, I think, who were paying, you know, between the workers and the people who were paying to be there. The first week that we were there, I mean, I guess one of the blessings of the hurricane is that I think 80 or 90 percent of the people canceled their trip. And so we had the entire cruise ship almost to ourselves. Um, but by the second week, everybody came back on and we did have to work around um, the passengers, which was hard. I mean, we, luckily the people, the reps from the cruise ship, you know, really worked with us. And so we would plan it so that we would be in contained spaces like the cruise ship room, you know, while we were out to sea. And then when we would dock um, at a place for the day, most of the passengers get off to go explore whatever town we happen to be in. And we would all stay on the ship and we would shoot in the public, like the pool and the restaurants and the places that uh, when we were at sea, we were packed and, you know, wouldn't really lend itself to shooting a film. So that's, that's sort of how we, we did it. Wow. Definitely calm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Um, ooh, this is, this is going to be a tough question, but I think it is actually a very important question because it's uh, something you and I have probably both run up against and it's, it's a little tricky for us. Um, and that's, have you ever been in a situation where you had to tell the cinematographer what equipment they were going to use? Um, no, I mean, I've been in a situation where I've had to disappoint the DP and say, we're not going to be able to give him or her what she was hoping for, but it's never been in sort of a dictator kind of way. I mean, I remember, uh, where's Kira actually, Brad Young, um, and our director, Andrew, uh, really wanted to shoot film and I remember we were going back and forth with you actually because you were going out of your way to to make it happen for him and you know getting us a really good camera package but we ended up just running the costs and from the post side of things weren't able to make it work and so I, I remember that was a hard conversation that I had to have with Andrew and Brad um, and they were great about it and understood and then we made the pivot over to digital but other than that I mean I think for the most part, whatever the DP has come in and wanted to shoot on, we were able to, to make it work. And again, a lot of that has to do with, you know, you're always very gracious and <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> you productions. But I mean, I guess maybe I've been lucky in, in that respect. Have you, have you ever had mandates come down from above on what you needed to use or what you couldn't uh, use? Yeah, I mean, some of the mandates like have required the DP to shoot, you know, because they require 4K. It's like limited. I, th I think if they were to come in and have a blank slate, they would choose other things. But because from the start, they have a list of certain requirements, it, it boxes them in a little bit, but not in a way. I mean, no one's ever really been upset about it. So gotcha. I have bad experiences. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting, um, new world, especially with those kind of mandates coming in. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> there's some funny questions coming in. I'm just reading through them here. <laughs> um, so there's somebody asking about, um, the price difference between shooting, um, specifically 16 millimeter in digital, um, and dealing with rentals, dealing with processing of dailies, um, 
versus like an on-set kind of digital workflow. Um, do you have kind of a sense of where that lies? Is one more expensive than the other or more challenging? I mean, I honestly that? feel like you're probably more of an expert. I mean, I haven't, the last few movies I've done, we've been digital from the start. So I haven't, I haven't had to do a comparison. Um, it's been a couple of years. And so things have maybe changed. I know back when I was doing those comparisons, it always seemed like film was actually cheaper for the production period. Um, uh, you, you know, and so in that respect, I liked it, but it always seemed like it was going to cost more. Like the bids that we would get on the back end were just extremely expensive and made it so that we were never able to do it. Both it was in the processing of dailies, um, you know, the DI. But again, that's that's been a couple of years for me. So I mean, I would probably throw that back to you and I, based on what you're seeing, you know, if if it seems like film is more expensive or not. I think, I think there's uh, a little bit of fear that's built into film that people are having a tough time getting over because, you know, it's with digital for, for a certain extent, you kind of are able to see what you're going to get and everybody can kind of see that um, based on how the, you know, the set is set up, of course, um, and how monitoring is, is calibrated and so on and so forth. But, you know, I think, I think that a lot of people have gotten so used to like that instant gratification of seeing it right there pretty much very close to the way it's going to be mm -hmm. and, and having that confidence and walking away and say, yeah, we got the day done as versus, you know, looking through a video tap, which, you know, pretty much every cinematographer will tell you that the video tap is not, don't even think that that's what it's going to look like. It's not anywhere near it. And, you know, and then having to wait and find out, Hey, did we get it? Did we not get it? Um, and I think, there's, you know, there's fear about the added kind of in-betweens of what you have to deal with with film, even though it's a time-proven technology. It's been around for over 100 years. So, yeah, it's it's interesting listening to people because I've had people come back and say they've been able to shoot film and it, they've been able to do it for the same budget as what it would have been for digital. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, there's so many variables involved with what you choose to shoot. Is it 16? Is it 35? Is it spherical? Is it anamorphic? Is it large format? You know, are, are you shooting raw? Are you shooting compressed? You know, there's just so many things. So it's tough to, I, I understand from your perspective that it can be very, very difficult to judge um, which one's more expensive or not. So, yeah, but uh, I think that still comes up to this day. You know, people are still wanting to shoot film, like you said, and still wanting to find a way to make that happen, but um, it can be a challenge. Yeah. I mean, my, anytime a DP comes and says, you know, that they want to explore the idea. I mean, for me, it's just a matter of making the numbers work. So I'm always happy to look into it and, you know, if ultimately it all adds up and we're able to do it. I sort of have no reason to say no. So, but again, I mean, you know, it's been a couple of years um, that anyone has been asked about that for me. So. <laughs> all good. Yeah. Um, the, so when choosing a project, um, have you ever chosen a project based on the content over the people that you were going to be working with or vice versa. You've chosen it. You've chosen it based on the people you're going to work with over the content. Um, no, I mean, I, I think I've been incredibly lucky in that the content that I respond to has always had great people associated with it. I mean, these days I'm lucky in that I tend to work with either a director more than once or producers more than once. And so I guess in that way, I'm choosing the people over the content, but the scripts that they send me happen to be fantastic. So, you know, I'm not really compromising one for the other. Um, and again, in the beginning of my career, I chose whatever, uh, anyone who wanted to hire me, I said, yes. So it didn't matter about the people or, <laughs> or the contents. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think these days it's the people first because it's relationships that I've um, established, you know, throughout my years of doing this. And so those people approach me and then sort of drop the contents in my lap. Gotcha. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a very specific question here asking again about budgeting and is there a particular uh, software that you use when you budget? I, I use movie magic, which is um, from entertainment partners. It's their software. Um, and, at least in the like in the film world, that's um, that's what everyone seems to use. So I think if you're looking to practice, then you should try on that. I'm not. I don't work in the world of TV or commercials, so I'm not sure. I think there might be like a different software for them. But mm. movie magic budgeting. <laughs> 
Well, that's interesting. I'm going to go off tangent now and ask you, why do you only do features? Why don't you do uh, TV and commercials? Um, I mean, honestly, it's the offers that I, you know, it's the, those are the job offers that I get. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I think I probably could dip my toe into the, the commercial world if I wanted, especially like, you know, knowing Jackie and Lance over at park and, but, um, at this point, it's like, I love what I do so much that it's, you know, th those are sort of the jobs that I, that I seek out. And I, I also like living a bit of a nomadic life. And so having been Vincent's assistant on Criminal Intent, I saw what it was like to be on a TV series for 10 months out of the year, you know? Um, and it's just right now, at least not appealing to me. I, I like, I like the fact that I can go to a new place and meet new people, um, you know, every five or six months. Is there, um, is there a particular place that you visited through your travels where you're like, you know what, if I had a choice, that's where I would settle down and that's where I would live the rest of my life. Um, I mean, I liked when, when we did life itself in Spain, I felt that way about, cause I traveled around Europe after and I sort of felt that way about Europe. Um, I made a movie in Vancouver and I think I was lucky cause I was there during the non rainy season. So <laughs> I, don't know that I would feel the same way if I had been there at a different time, but I, you I spent a, like you spent a whole four weeks there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Five days. Uh, no, it was, um, yeah, it, I really, I felt like I could have lived there too, but otherwise, I mean, I, you know, I'm based in New York city and love it there and don't think I'll ever, uh, live anywhere else and so it's that's what i like is that i get to sort of break off from there you know and go experience other places and countries for short periods of time and then come back home mm. and you chose to base yourself out of new york city as opposed to los angeles um and working in the feature world um was that was that a decision you made early on is that something you're still considering or you know i'm just curious yeah no I, mean, I think i'm in new york to stay and it really had it was simply to do with the fact that when I graduated college, my roommates were moving to New York city. And so it felt safe, you know, like I could go there with and already have friends. Um, so, and like that city just seemed so big to me. Like I grew up in a tiny town. So the idea of going to a, a city by myself just was scary. So I, I liked that I had them, uh, my friends with me. And, um, and I knew that there was uh, an industry, you know, for film and TV so that I could try to, try to break in there. My family was in Rhode Island. So I just like the idea of like keeping it on the East coast. Um, and I like LA when I go out there to visit, but I, it's not, I don't feel like I could live there, you know, when I, when I go out there. So, um, I would happily go out there for a job, but that's it. <laughs> okay. Um, another really interesting question coming in. Um, I know it can be different between the indie world and the, and the studio world, but, um, uh, someone's asking, you know, how much crossover there is between a uh, unit production manager and a line producer and kind of the differences between that. Cause I know that some people will get kind of a credit for both, you know, they'll get credit for being an actual executive producer, but they'll also be the UPM. You never know what, how that works. So I'm just curious from your perspective in those two different worlds, how do those cross over? Um, I mean, I think in the indie world, there's oftentimes just not enough money to have both a line producer and a UPM. So one person tends to do, you know, both of those jobs. And then in the studio world, there is enough money. So, but, um, but like I work very closely with my UPM, we're sort of doing, we're sort of doing the, I don't want to say the same job, but like that's my right hand person, you know, and then it's the UPM's job to sort of interface with the crew and, and, you know, be dealing with them on a day to day basis. Um, and like, then the UPM is coming to me, you know, with all the issues. I mean, most of the movies though, that I do, I, I take the EP credit and the UPM credit, but like I'll have a couple UPM with me. And that simply boils down to the fact that I'm a member of the DGA and, um, enjoy, getting health insurance and a pension and residuals and, you know, so, um, but yeah, I think, I, I guess I would say, you know, in the indie world, because of the size of the budget, it's, it's really just one person. Mm. Parts. Okay. Uh, it's, it's great to understand the difference because it is an interesting kind of structure within the production team. And there's a lot of, um, 
it always blows my mind because I'll go visit a feature film and I'll go to the office first and, and meet all these amazing people and you just see the machinery behind it and everything that all the people um, working to get all the things done that need to get done for that day yeah. um, and planning ahead. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think that the line producer is like the one mapping out the overall plan and then the UPM is the one who's actually taking that plan and then, you know, putting it into action and making it happen. Gotcha. No, that's a very clear way. Yeah. Of putting it. Yep. Okay. Uh, ooh, wow. Uh, here's a question from my colleague, uh, overseas asking, you know, how do you relax during a shoot or do you not relax during a shoot? <laughs> during a shoot, not really. I mean, that's like our business is just 24 seven. So I think, you know, when we're, when I'm on a movie, I'm working all the time. Um, like on weekends, I'll try to go to a museum or read a book or, but I normally, the way that I relax is that at the end of a movie, I these days try to take like two or three weeks off and travel somewhere um, as a way of taking a proper break. So I save nice. my relaxation for once I'm wrapped. <laughs> <laughs> very, very nice. Um, we get this question a lot. It's actually from our previous episodes, this question comes in. I think it's always a nice one to, to talk about. Is there, is there um, someone either, you know, directors or producers or, you know, filmmakers of some type that you really would like to work with in the future that you haven't had the opportunity to work with yet? Uh, I think if one day I'm lucky enough to be in big enough uh, movies, like working in big enough movies, I'd like to work with Catherine Bigelow. Um, but yeah, no, otherwise I'm sort of happy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So you've told me that you like to do a lot of reading on the side as kind of like a hobby. And uh, I'm just curious, you know, the genres that you're interested in and does that, does that kind of carry over into your, um, to your career as well, your professional life? Yeah, it can. I mean, I like movies that are books, sorry, that are, that have some sort of historic, like even if they're fictional, they have some sort of um, historical uh, value to them. So um yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, they don't okay. really, they don't tend to carry over, I think, into my work. Um, but yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I actually have had a lot of time to read now since we're in a pandemic, but prior to that, I haven't. I read my first Stephen King uh, book the other day. It's like, a, it's called 1122. Oh, yeah. Because right? it, it was about history. It's, it's what, it's what would the world have been if, if John Kennedy hadn't been shot and killed? That's and really they have a series out on it. So I guess it does kind of cross over. They made a series. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised that that was your first Stephen King. I thought being a New Englander, being yeah. an avid reader, you for sure would have had Stephen King all over your bookshelf. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not really into horror films, so. <laughs> <laughs> the, books are, the books have a tendency to be very different than the films. And really? I, I, enjoy, I enjoy both because I'm kind of twisted. Um, but... Uh, if you have a chance, go back and read some of his original stuff. I would highly suggest, you know, Carrie and The Shining and uh, Salem's Lot and some of those first first books he read he wrote because not only are they slightly shorter because he has a tendency to have <laughs> some <laughs> some books that are very long, um, but uh, they're just I, I just think they're amazing stories and he just grabs you right away and mm -hmm. you just can't let go and. Um, and then they're so different from the movie adaptations, at least for me, I thought they were. So completely yeah. different experience. Ah, and I'll check that's it out. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever, have you ever read something that you've suggested to, um, to a filmmaker and said, you know, you should take a look at this. This could make an interesting movie or you might just like the story or. You know. No, I mean, I haven't. I, I like, I remember loving the book The Alienist before it then became you know a series and but like I didn't have I didn't know anybody then I was just production assistant so I think even if I had suggested you know when I read that book to people that they should turn it into something no one would have listened um but yeah no I really I really haven't I'm not I mean I'm like really just sort of a for better or worse like in a nuts and bolts kind of way like hand me the script and I'll make your movie for you you know but like the creative part of it all. Like I, I don't, I guess I don't ever think that I would even have uh, enough people that I know to like say, Hey, you should make this, this book into a series, but I should, that'll be my goal during this pandemic. I'll read some, my goal is to find something that I read and then try to turn it into. 
a movie. That's uh, I hear that's a big, that's a bigger challenge than most people think, you know, yeah. they read say this is going to make a great movie. And then they, you know, as they work along, you find that, I mean, I guess that's the way it is with anything collaborative like our art form is where you have so many different people coming in with so many different ideas, you know, between the director and the cinematographer, the producers, the actors, the people that are doing the costumes, the makeup, the production design, the music, all of these different art forms converging, you know, are going to have their individual kind of impact in changing what somebody originally was thinking when they read it. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I don't know if there's ever, going to be like a perfect scenario where somebody read this and said, I'm going to make this movie and it's going to be just like the way I read it. And I don't think that's possible. <laughs> yeah. I think you'd have to be like an uber powerful, like a Martin Scorsese, you know, someone who like has the power to take that control from start to mm. finish and make it their own. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so um, somebody asked about diversity on set and mm. some of the writers that are written for that. And I'm just curious, they want to know about your, uh, your experience. And if you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it's becoming, um, I've been more aware of it the, the past couple of years. I mean, I'm always someone who is trying to, you know, promote women being on the set and in film. And then um, the movie that I did late night, uh, where Mindy K. Lang was a producer, uh, she and the director were very, very proactive about wanting to make sure that we had uh, a diverse crew. Um, and I think every movie thereafter uh, that I've done, like the photograph, the producers again, I mean, one of the first things they said to me when I got the job was we want to make it a huge priority. So, you know, like when we come in from LA and, and we meet everyone, we want to see that you've hired a diverse crew and it's a diverse set. So, you know, I think it's great that everybody's very aware of it um, and making an effort. It's, I mean, it's a conversation that's had these days on every movie that I, that I'm a part of. Yeah. Do you, have you ever felt like it's impacted your ability to do your job? It's gotten in the way or it's been an issue? No, I haven't. I mean, I, I think it's great. I think it means sometimes you have to like search a little harder to make sure that you're finding, you know, a diverse um, group of, of candidates to put in front of everyone. But, um, but no, you know, I think, and I think it's uh, offering opportunities for folks who otherwise maybe wouldn't, you know, have a chance to get involved. Yeah. Yeah, I personally have noticed a huge change in the last uh, in the last you know five to six years. It's been it's been amazing, and I've been really fortunate in meeting um, all sorts of really different voices, and many of them you and I have worked with together. And it's just incredible to finally see those people have an opportunity. Yeah. And you know, and you know, there's always this debate about well, you know, you're you're looking at diversity, and you're not necessarily taking into account whether this person's qualified to do that job or not. And it's like, well, that's not true. No, of course we're going to find somebody that's qualified to do the job. We're not just going to hire somebody, um, you know, just to fill a quota. We still have a job to do. We still have things to do. And we got to make sure this is the, they're going to be doing the best they can. So um, it's, it's great that, you know, our industry is finally starting to get behind that and support that. Um, it's a, it's a game changer. It's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> So um, as we get kind of into the last couple of minutes of our uh, session here, I can't believe we're already approaching three o'clock on the East Coast, but uh, um, what's next? I mean, can you talk about some of the projects that are on the horizon and things you're excited about? Yeah, I mean, I was uh, or am doing a movie for Lionsgate called Undercover. Um, Steve Pink is directing it. He's awesome. Uh, and Jim Denault uh, is our DP. But again, you know, we got five weeks into prep and then um, COVID hits, so we're on hiatus. So right now uh, I'm just sort of waiting to see what's gonna happen with that. And, you know, I have a feeling that that will, I mean, I normally try to do two movies um, a year, but I have a feeling, you know, by the time we're up and running, that'll sort of take me to the end of 2020. So I'm just, yeah, I'm in a wait and see mode. Gotcha. You don't, do you ever, do you ever like line up kind of a few ideas of things that are going to go and how far in advance do you work normally? Yeah. I mean, I normally like when I'm in prep or at the beginning of the shoot of a movie, start getting scripts sent to me for, um, you know, what my next job could possibly be. So in an ideal world before I wrap the project I'm on, I like to know what I'm doing next. Um, but you know, I mean, right now, you know, I've been in Rhode Island uh, doing budgets 
for, for people who I, th I think the idea right now is that a lot of people are trying to line up content so that they have things that can go once we're given the green light. So I've been lucky in that I've been, been able to do that and use my brain while we're off. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I, I'd be curious what else you've been, you know, working on and, and I love hearing the stories about it. And uh, I think, you know, people have taken this time to kind of, um, rediscover what they enjoy doing in a way, you know, it's really been kind of a, an enlightening moment to take a look in the mirror and say, you know what, wow, I have this time. It's been forced upon me. What have I been missing? You know, what have I, what do I need to look at? What should I start doing again? Mm -hmm. And I've heard various stories, you know, from some of the people that joined us previous where they've gotten back into very specific still photography and been doing that or been at, have finally had an opportunity to sit down and read things that they haven't been able to read and have wanted to for quite some time, um, watch movies that they haven't been able to watch, um, sit down and get to spend time with their family who they've, you know, been away from for a while and whatnot. And it's really, really interesting, you know, to find ourselves in this situation, which we didn't create, but at the same time have found a way to adapt to and to embrace. And I know we all want to get back to doing what we love and, uh, and get back to working with each other because we are, in a way of family away from our family. And um, we want to find a way to do that again. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens though, when we come back and how we adapt to that. I think there's going to be some interesting changes coming. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so I hope that, uh, you know, you can come back and join us again soon. It would be, uh, it'd be great to have you back once we get back up and running again and talk about how the next project goes and uh, hopefully um, we will uh, just keep talking. <laughs> I <love> that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in the meantime, <laughs> please keep in touch. <laughs> I will. You too. <laughs> and uh, thank you again for joining us. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks uh, for having me. <laughs>